We made it back alive from another week of church camp. Yes. <laughs> I'm still alive. Um, it was a great, great week. Uh, our kids had a great time. They, uh, we had some girls who went for the first time uh, this year. And when their mom came back uh, to pick them up on Friday, the first thing she said is, we want to come back next year. That's what you want. That's what you want to hear. So I love church camp. I've always loved it as a camper. I've loved it as working as an adult volunteer. And uh, I have loved over the years the pranks that we have pulled over uh, on some different people. Uh, you know, it's all in fun. It's all in fun. But uh, at one camp we went to in Arkansas, this guy named Andy, who was in charge of the camp there, he would do this thing called Ooga Booga. And Ooga Booga is where he would... Had, he would sit across from someone else in a chair and he would give them a broom and he had a broom and he would say, all right, I want you to do everything I do. I want you to copy everything I do exactly as I do it. So he would do these different things. He'd be like, ooga, booga, booga, booga. And they'd have to do ooga, booga, booga, booga. And he'd go, ooga, booga. And they'd have to go, ooga, booga. And he'd do like five, six different of those things and then on the last one, he'd go, remember they're sitting down, he'd go, ooga, ooga. And whenever the, the kid would stand up and do that, someone would slip a pie under on his seat and they'd sit down in a pie. It was great. It was great. I love that. My friend Farron said that he used to, um, my friend Farron said he used to paint people's fingernails. He would paint the boys' fingernails while they were sleeping. <laughs> they wake up. Can you imagine waking up like, what the? How did I get fingernail polish on my fingers? Uh, and he said the boys would start putting socks on their hands so they couldn't paint, paint their fingers at night. I think that's hilarious. What a good time. I love a good prank. I do. I love a good prank. Uh, even when it's done on me, I'm like, hey, props to you. That was a good prank. Uh, so I love a good prank, but there's a difference between pulling a prank and actually scamming and taking advantage of someone, right? So have you ever been tricked by a scam and you just kicked yourself? Like, how did I fall for that? Like, how did I, I feel like an idiot. How did I fall for that scam? Have you ever made a really bad decision that ended up harming you either physically or emotionally? And you're just like, man, I wish I'd never done that. Is there, is there any way to prevent making bad decisions before you even get into them? Because that's what we want to do, right? If there was a way to prevent these bad things from happening, I want to know that. I want to know that way. And, and what about being the one on the other side of the situation? Are we supposed to be the type of person that takes advantage of someone's weakness? What do you think? No. no. Jesus summed it up this way. Matthew 10, 16. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Christians need to be wise as serpents and not get taken advantage of. On the other side, we need to be careful not to be the ones who are taking advantage of others. All right, so we're going to be in Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9, continuing our series in Joshua. Uh, you can go ahead and turn there. So being wise as serpents, what does that mean? Wise as serpents. Well, serpents were often used as describing someone who was crafty or sneaky, but Jesus is not using them as a negative example here. He's actually using it as a positive, like snakes are smart and they won't put themselves in danger. They won't put themselves in a situation where they're going to get killed. They're wise. We need to be wise as snakes. Uh, as the saying goes, as my dad used to say, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Because I fell for it twice, not once, but twice. Right? And there are several reasons why people get fooled. So many people get fooled or deceived because, number one, they didn't ask the Lord first before they took action. They didn't pray about it. They didn't ask the Lord, hey, what should we do before they take action? Joshua chapter 9. Um, before we read it, I want to set it up with some background information. So Joshua is the leader of the Israelites, right? Before him was Moses. 
and Moses was leading his people to the promised land, but Moses didn't get to go in because he sinned and he disobeyed God. And so Joshua had to take the baton and continue leading the people. So he was going to lead them to take over the land. They were going to take over different cities and take over the land, and this was going to be their promised land, right? So um, most of you probably know the story of Jericho, where they took that. It was really crazy by marching around it for like seven days, right? Uh, the next city they take is I. It's spelled A-I, but it's pronounced I. And that's a really cool story of their, you should read their battle strategy that they use. It's really awesome, the way they took that city. But you'll have to read that on your own time uh, earlier in the book of Joshua. So here they are, they've taken two major cities in this new land, and they keep moving. But we're going to see a situation where they've been successful so far, but things are going to change. Joshua chapter 9. Now when all the kings of the Jordan heard about these things, the kings in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea, as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, We have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. The Israelites said to the Hivites, But perhaps you live near us. So how can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, where, who are you and where do you come from? They answered, your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sihon king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, Take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours is warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. So does everybody see what's going on? Does everybody get the situation? These people, they had already heard how, you know, these Israelites, they just keep taking out city after city, king after king. And they know, like, we don't stand a chance. These guys are powerful. We don't want to go to war with them. Instead, we'll come up with a way to trick them to, to make a peace treaty with us that they can't touch us. Right? So let's see if the Israelites fall for it. Verse 14. <clears throat> The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, three days later, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out, and on the third day came to their cities, Gibeon, Kephirah, Beeroth and Kiriat Jerom. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders, but all the leaders answered, Hey, we have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we will do to them. We will let them live so that God's wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the whole assembly. So the leader's promise to them was kept. Then Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said, Why did you deceive us by saying, We live a long way from you, while actually we live near us? We are now under, you are now under a curse. You will never be released from service as woodcutters 
and water carriers for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you, and that is why we did this. We are now in your hands. Do to us whatever seems good and right to you. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites, and they did not kill them. That day he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose. And that is what they are to this day. So the Israelites fell for the trick, right? And how is that? I mean, how is it that Joshua is able to lead whole armies and be victorious and take out these major cities, yet he's fooled by this little, small group of people? He falls for their tricks. Well, the answer is in verse 14. The men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Did you catch that when we read it? They didn't ask God before they made this treaty. They didn't stop and say, hey, God, what do you think of this? Should we make this treaty with these people or not? Man, how many times have we made decisions in our lives without asking God first, and then we end up regretting it later because it turns out to be disaster, right? We decide to partner up with someone in business only to realize, find out that they're, a, they're, they're shady, right? <laughs> they're a shady person that we shouldn't have gone into business with. We took a job only to find out that the employers don't take very, very good care of their employees. We bought a house only to find out there were several things wrong with it, or it was in a bad neighborhood, or it was in a bad school district, and now we're stuck with it. We married someone and found out later that they were lazy or mean or some other undesirable character trait. We made a major purchase of some kind with money we didn't really have, and then all of a sudden we've extended ourselves beyond and all of a sudden our, our engine blows in our car and we don't have the money. Like we, we stranded ourselves, right? Do any of these sound familiar? And how do you think I thought of those examples? Because right. I've done some of them. Because yeah. I've done them. That's why. Now let me ask you a question. In these situations where you got burned, did you stop and ask the Lord for direction before you took action? A lot of times, a lot of times we get ourselves in those situations because we didn't pray about it. We just did whatever our flesh wanted to do in that moment. We didn't ask God, and then we, we end up with the consequences, right? So this Christian artist named KJ52 had a line in one of his songs. Uh, it's from the perspective of God saying this to us. He said, you, <clears throat> he said, you take action without, I'm sorry, you take steps without asking me, then you blame me for your calamities. You kidding me? You take steps without asking me, right? We take steps without praying about it first and asking God where he thinks we should go. And then it ends up disaster, and then we shake our fist at God and say, God, how could you allow this terrible thing to happen to me? And he's like, you didn't ask. <laughs> if you had asked, I could have steered you a different direction, but you didn't ask. You want to do this on your own. Yeah, that's right. So sometimes we get fooled, we get deceived because we don't pray and ask the Lord about it first. So on your next steps, the first one says, pray for guidance about a decision every day this week. So maybe you've got a decision you're dealing with right now, right? You've got a situation that's tricky and you really need prayer. Make sure you pray about it every day this week before you go forward with it. I don't know about you, I don't know about y'all, but I like to be sure that I've heard from the Lord. Like, I don't want to be kind of sure. I want to be sure, if, especially if it's a big decision. I, I don't like uh, things biting me in the rear. <laughs> I want God's blessing. Amen. All right, so another, another reason we get into bad situations sometimes is we just didn't take time to gather the facts. Like, we didn't investigate the situation enough. So I was reading this story of Joshua, and I was, as far as I could tell, they didn't take the time to really check into who these people, these Gibeonites were, right? It, it doesn't seem like they asked a lot of questions to the Gibeonites, like, who are you? I mean, they asked a couple questions, but not many. It's like, you know, um, they, they didn't take the time to ask the other neighboring countries, hey, do you know who these people are? Can you vouch for them? Has anybody, has anybody even heard these people? 
maybe if they had talked to someone neighboring, they would have been like, yeah, they live right there. They're not from far away, right? They're, they're tricking you. But they didn't take time to investigate the facts. Um, and a lot of times we get ourselves in bad situations. So I got this text on my phone last week from Fifth Third Bank. And the text said, your account, your bank account has been suspended due to violation of our policies. And I was like, what? I've never gotten a text like that. Like, what is this? And it was like, click this link to fix it. There you go. See, some of you are smart. You already know. No, don't do it. So what did I do? I went to the bank. I said, hey, is our is our account suspended or is it in? They're like, no, it's in good standing. I'm like, okay, it's a scam. I thought it was a scam. But how long did that take for me to go to drive down the street, ask, just ask the question, right? And they're like, no, you're good. Don't click on anything. Um, there were many times that I was uh, a manager at McDonald's and I hired somebody that I ended up regretting hiring. Oh man, I got a long list of people like, why in the world did I hire that person? That was stupid. Sometimes I did the right thing and I called, I did the reference checks and I called their last job and I did all that. And most of those turned out good. It was the times I didn't do the reference checks and the last job, I'll bet you anything, if I called their last job, they would have been like, oh yeah, he quit on us, no call, no show, never came back. Like, and, and if I had done that phone call like I was supposed to, you know, I would have saved myself some heartache. But unfortunately, has anybody worked in fast food management before? Anybody done fast food management? Okay, you know how it gets. You get desperate for employees sometimes. And, and we like to use what we call the fog of mirror test. Can you fog a mirror? In other words, are you breathing? Okay, you fog the mirror. You're hired. <laughs> that is not a good strategy. Not a good strategy. Man, yeah, right now, it's, they're desperate. So look, guys, we got things like, we got all kinds of resources. Like we, we got Kelly Blue Book. We got Carfax. You know, we got consumer reports. My brother, that's actually one of his, his habits, his, his hobbies is he likes reading the consumer reports on all the vehicles, uh, you know, because after people have driven vehicles, they actually report on them and say, you know, here's when it started, when things started breaking and whatever. They, they gather all this together and put it in consumer reports. So my brother, he's kind of a nerd in that way. He likes reading those things. And he told me, he said, um, Jeremy, whenever you go to buy a car, call me first and I'll look it up under the consumer reports and tell you how the car did. Right? So you're not just blindly buying a car that you don't know anything about. So the first car I called him about, I was like, okay, I'm looking at a Toyota Corolla. He's like, I don't even have to look that one up. It's going to be fine. Those Toyotas always do good. You know, I don't even need to look it up. I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, next car I looked up, I, I said, I'm thinking about buying a Honda Civic. He said, you're going to be fine. I don't even have to look that up. Honda's going to be fine. I'm like, okay. Uh, now, I did buy a Honda Odyssey in the rain one day, and I will never buy a car in the rain again, because I'll tell you what happened. It was raining out, so I didn't just stand out there maybe as long as I should have to really check it out. So I did look underneath the car and make sure there were no leaks and all that. It was dry. It was good. But apparently on the top of the car, they, they lived in Utah. And apparently that sun in Utah is powerful. And it like just beat that at the top of the car. There was no paint on the top of the car. None. One day we were in a cabin. We were looking down from a second story. We're like, our, our car has no paint on the top of it. This is crazy. Uh, but we bought it in the rain. It was dark. I'll never do that again. Never buy a car in the rain. Don't do it. Um, but we have all kinds of resources, right? We have reviews. You, you can read these you know, read their five-star reviews. Read what people wrote about things. There's really no excuse to buy something that's junk anymore. We can read so many reviews. Don't get caught getting something, getting stuck with something bad. Right? So, be wise as servants. And then on the other side, we have be harmless or innocent as doves. Be innocent as doves. What does that mean? You know, when I, I first read that, I started studying this. What did Jesus mean by Harmless as doves. That's kind of an interesting phrase, isn't it? And, and I was reading the Bible commentaries and stuff, and here's what it said. It said it means, let no one be able to bring a charge against you in terms of doing anything shady or underhanded. 
All right? No one, no one can charge you for being shady or underhanded. Harmless as doves is to be sincere and have pure intentions. That's what it means. Have good motives, not have shady motives, right? So let's go back to buying a car situation. You're buying a car. To be wise as serpents means don't get ripped off. Don't pay more than it's worth, right? We have Kelly Blue Book. We can look up exactly how much the car is worth. Don't pay more than that, that value, right? But on the other side, you know, some people really take great pride in talking people down on their price, and they'll just keep talking them down, 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 and use pressure, 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 and talk them down, down, down. And then they, they feel real proud that they got it for like a thousand under what it's worth. And I'm like, you know, I don't know if we should feel so good about that. Because I think God wants us to pay what's fair to somebody. You know, somebody might say, well, they agreed to it. That's their problem, right? You know, that's their problem. Really? I mean, we're, isn't, didn't Jesus say we're supposed to do unto others as they, we would want them to do to us? Would we want someone to talk us way down and, and you know, steal, steal the, the sale, you know, and give us basically nothing, not what it's worth? No. You know, and somebody might say, well, I wouldn't have agreed to that price if I were them. That's their problem. Oh, really? So we're feeling good about taking advantage of weak-minded people, weak-willed people. That's good. That's something, you know. Um, if you use fast talk, fast talking or deception or trickery to get it, then that's the wrong way to go about it, right? Like, like <clears throat> lying and saying, yeah, I've got, I've got another buyer that said they're going to give me X amount of dollars. You don't have another buyer. You're just making that up to try to jack up the price on them. Like, oh, yeah, I've got another buyer that said they give me. 6,000. There's no other buyer. That's lying, right? We're not supposed to do that kind of stuff. So, um, <laughs> I went to China on a mission trip, and my buddy Ryan was with me. And in China, they have a different kind of system of buying things. So, here in America, you go in the store, there's a sticker, and that's the price, right? That's what you got to pay. That's what the owner wants, and they're, you're not getting it for less than that. But in China, they you can haggle over price right so my friend Ryan walks up to this this lady she has all these spices and stuff and she has actual cinnamon sticks like this giant piece of cinnamon bark I'm like, that's cool I've never seen one that big like that's the real deal right all of our stuff's ground up already in America so Ryan walks up he's like how much for that and she goes 50 quad he goes I'll give you 20 she goes no 50 quad. He's like, no, no, come on. I want it for 20. Give, give it to me for 20 now. She's like, no, 50. So then he hands, puts the 20 in her hand. It's like, I want this for 20. Give it to me for 20. You know what she did? She broke off a corner of it. So like, Here you go. And took the 20. I said, good for you, girl. <laughs> Don't let him get over on you. <laughs> that was awesome. Good for her. Like, oh, you want twenty dollars worth? Here's twenty dollars worth. <laughs> Take that. As Christians, we need to give people what is fair. Uh, we need to pay fair wages. You know, if you've got a job that's worth a hundred dollars and you know that's what it's worth, don't don't try to get over on some naive person that oh, I'm going to pay twenty five. I'm going to pay on it. If they'll do it for twenty five, I'm going to get it for twenty five. Um, the Bible says in First Timothy five eighteen, do not muzzle the ox. While it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. The worker is worthy of his wages. Someone does work, they deserve to be paid. To be paid was fair. Um, and by the way, Jesus said that second part. He was the original who said the worker is worth his wages. But what, what this is talking about is people who are just stingy and won't come off and pay somebody what's fair, right? They're so stingy that they're going to work an ox. You know, work an ox really hard, plowing the ground and planting the grain. And then when the grain grows, they're so stingy, they won't even take the muzzle off the ox and let him feed on some of the, the grain that he worked for. Right? That's pretty stingy. You know, hey, the, the ox worked hard for that grain. Give him some of the grain. That's what the Bible is saying. The worker is worth his wages. At one time, my dad employed about 10 people in a construction company. And there was this young guy named Eric. He was 18 years old. And uh, my dad was sending him to a town about 30 miles away, 30 minutes away or something, about 30 minutes. Um, 
And he said, Eric, I want you to keep track of your mileage because when you get back, I'm going to reimburse you for your mileage. I said, okay. So he gets back and he's like, Eric, did you did you keep track of your mileage? He goes, Oh no, Mr. Harper, I, I forgot. I forgot. And he's like, he's like, just give me five dollars on for gas and we'll call it good. And my dad goes, No, no, no. Sit down. I want to teach you something. You use more than gas in your vehicle. You use wear and tear on your tires. You put wear and tear on your engine. You're that much closer to needing an oil change. Your, your trip was worth more than just five dollars. Here, let's figure it up. And, and they said, let's figure out how many miles it is approximately that town. And then they did times 50 cents a mile or whatever. Ended up being like 15 or 20 dollars instead of the five. He's like, that's how much your trip was worth. You gotta be mindful of wear and tear on your vehicle. And one thing I always appreciated about my dad is he, he had this policy. He would tell me, he said, Jeremy, I never want anybody to be able to come back and, on me and say that I cheated them out of anything. And so I saw my dad pay more sometimes than really what it was worth. He would, he would make sure that he covered and paid them. You know, I, I saw him take a loss on a couple jobs sometimes because, you know, he quoted them something and then my dad forgot an item that it was going to take. And he's like, hey, I, I quoted you this price and so I'm going to stick to this price, but I just want to let you know. I'm going to lose some money on this. And sometimes they would come back and give them the extra money. But my dad wasn't going to do that to them. He wasn't going to charge them more than what he told them initially. You know, that's, that's the kind of guy he was. And I think that's the essence of being innocent as doves. So your last next step is evaluate what you're paying employees and check it against the going rates. Make sure you're paying some fair um, wages. So guys, in our doggy dog world, you know, in America, it's, it's do whatever it takes to make a buck, right? That's kind of the mentality. But I think Jesus would tell us we can do better than that. We can do better than do whatever, do whatever, shady or not, to make a buck. No, we can do better. We can be better, right? We can be better people for that. And I believe when we are better than that, people see that. They see something different in us. And it lets our light shine to them and say, man, you know, someone else would have just made me, made me eat the loss on that. But, but you're, you're actually being fair, you know. Um, we, can, we have an opportunity to let our light shine and let the world see something different about us. Amen. So let's be wise as servants. Wise as servants. Don't, don't be taken advantage of. Don't let someone get over on you. Use the resources we have. Ch take the time to pray about it. Right? That's number one. That's step one. Take the time to pray about it. Don't just make a decision without praying about it. I'm talking to myself too. Um, pray about it. Gather the facts. Be wise as servants. Don't just jump into a bad decision. Um, and then we need to be innocent as doves.